Hello, listeners. This is Jim the Keys bartender coming to you from the Florida Keys. Hope you're doing well today. I'd like to uh, send my support once again to the uh, Ukrainians fighting uh, valiantly in uh, their country to rid themselves of Russian uh, aggressors. And I'd like to start out with just uh, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. What that's what that is all about. If you're not familiar with the news, a island off in the, in uh, off the coast of Ukraine, a Ukrainian island, was being approached by a Russian warship uh, yesterday, and uh, there were 13 security guards or border guards. I'm not exactly sure, but there were. Uh, for uh, uh, they they were Ukrainian and they were hailed by a Russian warship that asked them to inform them that they would uh, ask them to lay down their arms. And originally, the guy who was uh, returning the hail said, uh, "Fuck you." And then do you hear some talking in the background? And uh, he said, "You should make and you hear something. You should make yourself clear." And he says, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. And what I was told by people that understand the language somewhat, the um, it was much darker than that, what they said, the, the meaning of that, which is pretty good. But right after, uh, and, and sadly, which what it, you know could have been expected, the Russian warship shelled... Uh, the island so much and killed every member of the security team. Um, some people say, hey, listen, they should have surrendered. Other people, they don't, that should be probably the emblem or anthem for uh, Ukrainian resistance. And right now, Ukraine is winning the war of uh, public relations. Uh, Putin holding back all the You know, there's no amount of, I guess, positive press releases that they'd be able to do showing Russians going into a country because his, uh, uh, Putin's last statement was, according to uh, uh, what he released, was that uh, he was asked directly, would he negotiate with the current Ukrainian government? And he said he wouldn't. Uh, negotiate with those group of drug addicts and fascists. Keep in mind that Zelensky, who uh, is the president of the Ukraine, is Jewish, which would hinder him from being a very good fascist. You know, just like a black man, just like Dave Chappelle playing a black Klansman. Um, but you. You know, if you think about it, when Putin intended to probably invade, they probably expected the Ukraine to fold. And all this buildup prior to, uh, you know, the weeks and weeks of buildup prior to has driven people to, to think about it first. You know, so they had been mentally prepared that there was a possibility of a Russian incursion. And the way they got the information that they were surrounded on all sides, they're not surprised that it was happened. So they had time to think about it. Uh, Perhaps some people say that they should have mobilized earlier, which a mobilization could have been a incentive for Russia to launch an attack earlier. But uh, doing the general mobilization now, it looks as if the Ukrainian resistance is stiffening up. My feeling is that even though the uh, Russians are advancing on Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, is that a lot of, there's going to be a lot of Russian casualties. So far, it, it appears from multiple news sources that there has been more Russian casualties than there have been Ukrainian casualties. And 
urban fighting is some of the toughest fighting you could enter. Going into a Ukraine with tens of thousands of Ukrainians, some with uh, automatic weapons and javelin shoulder-fired anti-tank missiles. And there, there appears as if there is an, an they have an anti-aircraft capability because they've been downing some of their helicopters. I don't know so far about the jets. But uh, it, it appears that Putin underestimated the amount of resistance he'd get. And if his intention is to go into Kiev and try to decapitate the Ukrainian government, the current government, and put in his own puppet government, the, there's two things that could happen. I mean, multiple things that could happen. But one of the things is Zelensky doesn't get caught and he leads the government in exile. Okay. They take Kiev. Now, Putin could set up his own government and say, listen, this is a person coming in here. They're going to sign some kind of pseudo, if they take Kiev, they're going to sign some kind of uh, pseudo peace treaty with the new government and expect uh, fealty from all the regional uh, governments in the Ukraine, which according to everything everyone has seen, there has not been mass surrendering of Ukraine forces yet. And on the contrary, Ukrainian forces have captured some of the people in the Dumbass region. It sounds like dumbasses, you know, the, the separatists that were uh, controlling an area in the far eastern part of Ukraine. So, and they're letting, you know, currently, you'll, you can follow the news, you can find out all the movements and stuff like that. But what I'm saying is that the intention of the, the folding, now the multi, yesterday we spoke about how uh, the attack on the Ukraine is stealing the resolve of member states of the Eastern European countries that used to be associated with the Soviets now are associated with NATO. Now they've stealed the influence there. The Baltic countries, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Hungary. They're not the Baltic countries. I'm just in, in, besides the Baltic countries. Um, NATO is sending forces there. The uh, general secretary of the NATO alliance uh, reiterated that uh, any attack on any NATO member is an attack on on all of them, and which he announced. And making the announcement there is either it is NATO or it isn't NATO. And it, if the treaty is enforced, that means any incursion by a, a Russia would be considered attack on one. Now they'd have to face not only the Ukraine insurgency, they'd have to face the entire entirety of NATO. So... This could uh, have all the earmarks of uh, backfiring on Putin. And I don't see how a insurgency, e even if they were able to, which there it seems to be slowing down. There's another night approaching. It's 10 o'clock as, as I speak right now. It's 10 o'clock in the evening in the Ukraine. In at least part of the Ukraine. I think it's all in the same time zone. Ukraine is the size of Texas. Right? There's currently 190,000 troops that they had available to go inside. There's a, there's probably 1,000 uh, less because of the Russian soldiers were... And, and I do I do have some sympathy for Russian soldiers that are, are in the military and did not get obviously a say or vote on whether they should attack the Ukraine or not or go against a peaceful neighbor. And you can argue all you want. So I I have to go into work. Yesterday when I was in work, I heard people talk, well, aren't, don't they? They're, they're pretty much the same, aren't they? The Russians and the Ukrainians. And they're trying to say it's like a civil war. And it's not a civil war. It's a separate country. And I think of it, Canada. And Canada, they, Canada speaks the same dialect that we speak. 
of English. English is English. It's not even, they don't even have an accent. They have a slight accent. If you're talking about a boot, you know, was that all a boot, Jim? So just imagine because we speak the same language, same share the same similar cultures, that we would have the right to seek unification with Canada, which uh, that's a separate country. Long tradition, too. So, I mean, people say, well, they've been independent for 200 years. Well, the Ukraine was separate for years. Trust me. The Ukrainians, their language is as related to Russian as Ukrainian is related to Polish. Get that through your head. Now, World War II, Russians invaded Poland in unison with the Germans. A lot of people forget about that. We do a lot of ass-kissing to the Russians about how they bore the brunt of hostilities during World War II. But, you know, in the beginning, the first year, they were, if not allies, they were co-belligerents with the Germans at the beginning of World War II. And a strategist might say, well, they were just building a buffer zone between them and the Germans. No, they weren't, because Poland was the buffer zone. Poland was the buffer zone. If they had just, they had a choice when Germany suggested that they mutually attack Poland in 1939, it was, they had the right to say, oh yeah, we'll go along. They could have supported the uh, the Poles. And the Poles with the Germans, I mean, Poles with the Russians fighting against German aggressors might have stood a chance and World War End could have ended before it got too far away in the beginning. And France and Britain would have been able to do their thing on the east side. Now, just see, showing a weak hand. Some people blame Biden for showing a weak hand. But there, Ukraine was not a member of uh, NATO and sending any troops to Ukraine would be a violation of War Powers Act. In order to send soldiers to a non-treaty organization, the treaty, which was approved by the Senate, effectively the Congress, is the congressional approval. So Ukraine not being in NATO, they would need congressional approval for that. Many times, U.S. presidents have overlooked that little fine detail. But we wouldn't end starting a war now. People say, well, what do we have to do with that? Why would we why would we concern ourselves with Ukraine? Why would we concern ourselves with all of Eastern Europe? Why don't we just pull out? Well, that's fine and dandy. That's isolationism, and that is a view. I understand that. But you cannot go and only attack foreign countries. If you don't have allies, then you're out on your own, right? So our treaty organization, which was set up post-World War II to protect us against a burgeoning and and strong Soviet Union. And we also have one in Southeast Asia called CETO, Southeast Asian uh, Treaty Organization. And the members are Japan, South Korea, I think Australia, used to be the Philippines, but all those are there to, to combat an aggressor in the Far East. And America has a unique position among nations where they have, their on the Atlantic and the Pacific. When I say unique among the large powers, Mexico, not necessarily Mexico because it's actually on the Gulf of Mexico and it's not directly on the Atlantic. The Yucatan's kind of like on the Atlantic. Or is that the Caribbean? But, so we have, and and having a state, Hawaii, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and territories in the Far East, 
like the, the Marshall Islands, Guam, American Samoa, has a unique position where, yes, we have interest there. And we do have interest in free trade and non-interference with uh, from democratic countries that don't harbor terrorists. Because I'm referring to what happened with Afghanistan and say, well, we did invade Afghanistan. Yes, we invaded Afghanistan after 9-11 because they harbored uh, cells of Al- uh, training cells of Al-Qaeda and the head of Al-Qaeda, which is Osama bin Laden. Now, garnering allies is essential, even though U.S. could do a lot of these things on its own. It would be great. Uh, that's when America does its greatest work normally. And and how they took down Iraq so easily was with allies. Originally, I guess the best example of using allies and showing how was the first Persian Gulf War, where they went in and out. So the Russians going by themselves against the neighbor. That was closer to alignment to our American foreign policy in the 1800s with Mexico. Let's say. Because America actually sent uh, troops into Mexico multiple times. There was a Mexican American War. There was, in prior to World War I, there was a Mexican revolutionary named Pancho Villa. Uh, they called him a, a bandit in the U.S., but he was actually a, a revolutionary in Mexico. And when he had went over the border, when elements of Pancho Villa, Villa's organization went over the border, the U.S. military followed him in and violated the Mexican uh, territoriality prior to World War One. And a war didn't start there. But we, we didn't go and change the... Uh, Mexican government. We did that during, we did that, uh, if you ever hear the Marine Corps anthem, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. The shores of Tripoli refers to the Barbary pirates that were attacking in the early 1800s, and the halls of Montezuma was the Mexican-America War, where Americans uh, went into uh, Mexico and unseated that government. Whether viable or not, the reason for it, there was actually, it could have been, it was viewed as a land grab. And there was very little cultural sharing between Mexico and the United States, if you think about it. In the Southwest, there was a heavy, uh, where the ter- there were Southwest territories that the U.S. either claimed or was about to claim, and there was Mexican territory. And there, the, you know, you couldn't say that we culturally shared the same language, or we can we couldn't say that we shared the same religion even. But there was there was a claim made. So the Russian claim about ten years ago, the Russian claim that the uh, Putin put out there is that traditionally they are the same people. They are the same people. You go back far enough, there were one people, blah, 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 this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it all before. It's been used often. So you're one people. We care about you. We're just going in there to take care, get your government out of, you know, to put someone in that isn't a criminal. They're suggesting it doesn't really matter because the president of the Ukraine and his administration is criminal. So we're, we're just going in to do that. And we're not really, they're, they're suggesting now they're not really attacking the military or the civilians or the infrastructure. They're just attacking the government. Tell that to the 13 guards on Snake Island. That's the name of the island. And the, I posted a little emblem, Ukrainian emblem that's already came up with this show starter here. Uh, tell that to the uh, families of the 13 survivors. That, oh, the Russians are doing this for, for you. you. Get rid of Or the tank that rolled over, you know, t- tank rolling over a passenger car. So eventually, 
the, the moves now is Russia is now moving into the Kiev. And then there's going to be heavy fighting there. And there's going to be a lot of people dying. My feeling, once again, is that the Russians, with the tactic they're trying to do to avoid um, to avoid civilian casualties, is a public relations tactic. Because of all the news organizations that are in the Ukraine, uh, they forget. They may forget that you really can't do anything without having a a record or an archived event because this war is going to become an archived event. I tried to explain this to Abby and to other people and people say, well, why are you so concerned about this? Well, as a history buff, as a history buff, when I am living through an event and I feel this is an event, everything's an event, but this is a significant event. Some people have suggesting this is a revival. This is the end of the Cold War. This is the end of the Cold War. The Cold War started post-World War II when uh, the former alliance, the uh, allies of World War II started separating over political differences or political ideological differences. And then... uh, this is the culmination. So the Cold War is over. Cold War signifies there were movements made, there were alliances, there were proxy wars. This is an outward, the, large, the largest uh, military incursion on a European continent. There was uh, Yugoslavia earlier. The Russians did invade Hungary and uh, the Czech, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia when it was Czechoslovakia at the time. In, I think Czechoslovakia was 60s. Hungary was in the 50s. Uh, Russian troops went in. There was an, uh, the governments weren't resisting. They, they moved them in to uh, support the regimes that were in power at the time. At this time, this is definitely a war. So, in that backdrop, what can people do? They can do all sorts of things. They can do. They can do uh, pledge support. There's money, and people say, "Well, why should I give money?" They just keep money at home. Well, if you care about, you know, all these people say, "This is why we don't give away our guns." This is why we give don't give away our guns. Well, send some of the money to. Uh, you can't send guns. Send some money uh, to support them. Maybe send some flak jackets or bulletproof vest. The Ukrainians can use it. Send it to the Ukrainians, not the Russians. And I understand there's one party in the United States. There's there's one party in the United States that's having a change of heart. Somewhat. Because a former number 45, the bloated orange guy, has expressed his admiration for the dictator in Russia who uh, right now is, I think he's going to have a really hard time explaining himself to the Russian people once losses start accumulating. And I think he was hoping for more of a fast folding of Ukrainian resistance instead of a stiffening one. And once people start losing, it depends. It really depends. Because the, if you look at the history of it, with, with being able to see other people resist and during World War II and the other times where people say, this is what happened in France. This is what happened in Poland. Poland only lasted one month when they were invaded by two sides. Well, Ukraine in the power uh let's say, disparity is much less between Ukraine and Russia right now. Now, Ukraine is weaker than Russia. But perhaps with the the better analysis would be with the Spanish Civil War when Germany and Italy supported the nationalist of Spain, which was headed by Francisco Franco, and the Republicans, in name only, were more of the socially progressive people were supported by this 
it's funny, they were supported by the Soviet Union at the time. And a lot of volunteers from around the world. Now, the, the nationalists had actually German and Italian pilots. They used the, uh, Italy and Germany used the Spanish Civil War as kind of a test, uh, a lab for their war tactics. So aerial bombing of civilian placements and things like that. If you ever seen Picasso's masterpiece Guernica, well, Guernica was a town in Republican-controlled Spain during the Spanish Civil War that was bombed by uh, the, the nationalists and effectively by from the Germans and the Italians to show, to see how air bombardment would work with more modern aircraft. They started air bombardments during World War One, but they were usually like handheld bombs that they would drop from biplanes and some of the larger biplanes they had. I think they just started experimenting at the end of World War One, But World War II saw area bombardment make uh, come of age. So when they're, they're, Russia is supported perhaps by China, Burma, North Korea, uh, some of its old vassal states. But effectively, the rest of the world, and China being all the way over there, China's just given lukewarm response. And the only reason China's given lukewarm response is because they, they, they don't want to lose, be sanctioned by the world because they're, they're used to, they need free trade. They, China needs free trade because they are uh, a country that has a positive trade balance with most countries so they can kind of pretty much say they're not going to condemn Russia but they don't have to support them now what Europe and NATO can do is just supply food um, lethal aid and things like that and the lethal aid is tough because it depends on uh, the Russians view it they may view that as an aggression but if uh if that's the case, then that's the decision they have to make. And a lot of people get angry. They say, you can't go, go lightly talk about World War II. I mean, World War Three. Just walking in there. Well, it's not. It's just stopping aggression where it shows. Because he's not going to stop at the Ukraine. He's not stopping at the Ukraine. This is his test. This uh, He had test. Uh, he They did their foreign thing. And you could say U.S. does it too. But they were in Syria. And they... You know, you've seen the horrible things that happen in Syria. It's totally destroyed. You know, we went to the aid of the uh, dictator in Syria, Assad, and they killed hundreds of thousands of Syrian uh, civilians. And we saw millions of them, uh, millions of refugees. Well, Ukraine is over two and a half times the size, population-wise. So, just see that, and it's right on the border, and there's former Soviet alliances right nearby, Moldova, the Baltic states, that have a real key, uh, real keen interest in what is going on, especially the Baltic states, since they have upwards of 40 to 50 percent of the residents of the Baltic states speak Russian. And if you speak Russian, according to Vladimir Putin, that makes you Russian. So, NATO being serious right now is actually a defense thing. If we, we either support our allies or don't support our allies. And Ukraine, though technically isn't part of NATO and stuff like that, they are a member of the democratically elected League of Nations. You can say that they're corrupt, but I can't see any country being more corrupt than, than Russia is right now. So that is the kettle calling the pot black, or the pot calling the kettle black. And I believe those 13 security guards or soldiers, or whatever you want to call them, on Snake Island, those Ukrainians, will be a battle cry for them. And there'll be new ones, too. There's a story of an older Russian woman walking up to soldiers in the 
Donbass region of of Ukraine. And she said, what the fuck are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. She's talking to him and she goes, here, I want you to take these sunflower seeds and put them in your pocket. And he goes, what, what? And, you know, like, that you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be doing this. He, you can hear the whole conversation this lady had. And eventually she said to him, yes, you should put them in your pocket because when you lay down here, and effectively when you die here, there'll be flowers growing where you drop. Uh, the sunflower is a uh, the national flower of the Ukraine. So, I know. You're going to say, Jim, I can't wait until you get back to doing bartending things. But this is what... They, you know what? I didn't go about doing a podcast. So I couldn't talk about things that I talk about. So I can talk about the things that inter- I interest. That I interest. I interest. What the hell? It's like I don't even speak the language anymore. I mean, the things I'm interested in. And I do appreciate appreciate appreciates the uh, downloads. I want to get as many as possible. And listen, I know I don't expect a lot of downloads in the Ukraine because y- you guys have more important things to do. But our job over here is, is uh, to help. And that's the pressure um, to do more to supply them and to back them up, to have their back. Because when dictators win, free people lose anywhere. Whenever that happens, whether it's in the Sudan, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Myanmar right now, because because the world's attention is uh, distracted. A lot of people, bad actors in the world, uh, on the state level, decide that's the time to act. I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank my friends who uh, enjoy the show and are with me on that. If you disagree with me on my views on that, just remember what those 13 uh, security guards said to the Russian ship. My sentiment exactly. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye.